less than 5%. In California, it's 4% of vineyards are organically farmed. Now, let's stop there for a moment. That means that 96% of the vineyards in California, and this is published by the state, I, this is not my opinion, 96% of the vineyards farmed in California are farmed with toxic chemicals. That is just a fact. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. You're listening to the Ancient Health Podcast. So thrilled that you joined us today. I am not with my co-host, Dr. Motley, so a little bummed about that, but every now and then we have to divide and conquer. So Dr. Motley sends his best, but we've got a great show for you today. We have a familiar guest with us, so you may know his story. You may be familiar with his products. If not, I know you're going to fall in love with his work and really what he's committed himself to. So Todd White is with us today for part two. He's the co-founder of Dry Farms Wine. It's a company that organically grows its grapes on family farms. They do this in countries all over the world, and then they independently lab test them for purity. So that is so important. We're going to dive into why uh, purity is such a, a valuable thing, especially when we're talking about things we're putting in our bodies. They're sugar-free. There are no additives. We're going to go run through all of it. So Todd, thank you so much for joining me today. Super excited to be here for a return visit. Thank you. I know. I kind of feel like we should, you know, cheers with a, a glass of, you know, it's summertime. So maybe like a white wine or something. A rosé, but it's 11 o'clock in the morning here. So it's true. I know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a little early, but, uh, you know, maybe in a couple hours we can roll that out. So I nice. personally am a huge fan of, of your work and ultimately like your products, like what you guys produce. Um, I have been a customer for a long time. When I told my husband who I was interviewing, he was like, make sure you tell them that you're like their biggest you know, billboard nice, in life nice. because it's the only thing. Honestly, I do not buy wine unless it's from you guys. So I want for everybody that's listening to really understand, cause we've got probably some wine drinkers and, uh, and I would actually love to just start off because in the previous episode, which I'm going to link for you guys in the show notes, because it's an incredible interview that Dr. Axe did with Todd and really talking about his story and really how it brought about uh, this, this line of wine and really what natural farming of wine really used to look like and how it looks today, what the differences are and what that means to your health. So I'm going to link that one in the show notes, but Todd, maybe bring us up to speed for those that maybe haven't listened to that episode where you're at today, where wine is, what like, you know, wineries, like the production of wine, like what is it that we're working with today? Well, I think we could, you know, we can start with how we got here. Like how did this problem occur? What's wrong? And there are three things that are really wrong. It's about a lot of money, first of all. That's what's created most of the problems. It's about toxic farming. And what I mean by that is less than 5%. And I'm going to tell you a lot of things that are pretty shocking and surprising about what goes in, on in the wine of the world of wine. And so it's easy to you. There are two ways for you to verify what I'm, you can do a simple Google search on everything I'm going to tell you, and you can do the research from your own, or you can go to our website and link out to um, accredited uh, scientific documents. And we've already done the work for you that say, when I tell you these things, you can go and there's an wine industry facts um, document on our wine on our website that will just show you that everything I'm about to tell you, which is kind of surprising and shocking, people are like, oh, that can't be true. And of course, the wine industry wants to say, oh, it's not true. This guy just wants to sell wine. And while I do enjoy selling wine, that's how I make a living. Um, that's not what this is really about. This is really about introducing people to the facts and education that I have that made my wine drinking life a better experience. And on this podcast, we'll also get into the toxicity of alcohol and why I recommend that many people don't drink and I don't want to sell them wine and why alcohol is in fact highly toxic. And breaking news recently, drinking is not healthy for you in any amount, which I happen to agree with. So that surprises people from the wine guy to say, what do you mean drinking wine is not healthy? Well, drinking alcohol in any amount, I don't think is healthy for humans. Oh, but guess what? I drink wine, you know, and a fair amount of it. So let's talk about all that in a moment, because I think that's really important. 
because in the health world right now, there's a lot of alcohol bashing going on. And I, and I happen to agree with most of it. And, and that's why I started this company, why the education and information I have is so important for people who do choose to drink and particularly who choose to drink wine. But let's stand back at 10,000 feet real quickly. Here's, here's what happened. There are three things uh, that kind of created this problem. One is money. We'll get to that in a second. Number two is toxic farming. Um, less than 5% in California, it's 4% of vineyards are organically farmed. Now let's stop there for a moment. That means that 96% of the vineyards in California, and this is published by the state, I, this is not my opinion, 96% of the vineyards farmed in California are farmed with toxic chemicals. That is just a fact. And so we believe that toxic farming is not only bad for your health, but it's also bad for the planet. This toxic farming has been going on worldwide since the early 1920s. Uh, number three are unhealthy and toxic additives that are legal and may be added to wine um, at various phases in the winemaking process. There are 76 legal additives approved by the government for the use of winemaking. We'll talk about those in a moment because some of them are pretty scary. But let's start at money. So the money thing is that what happened in the food industry is the same thing that happened in the wine industry. So basically, if you go to the center part of the grocery store, uh, about nine or 10 companies make most of the products in the center part of the grocery store. And if you go to the wine aisle, you have a similar situation. So the top three wine companies in the United States make 60% of U.S. wines. And the top 25 companies make a staggering 90% of all wine. So when you go to the grocery aisle or in a bottle shop and you look at these wine bottles, 90% of them are made by a handful of companies. And now they don't want you to know that, so they hide behind thousands of brands and labels. And this is the money problem because these are not, you know, when you look at a wine bottle, you see a cute animal on it or you see a chateau or a farmhouse because they want you to think that you're drinking from this farmhouse. When in fact, in 90% of cases, you're drinking from massive factories located in Central California uh, with toxically farmed fruit. These are just statistical facts, industry facts. I didn't make any of this up. It's just people don't know about it. Industry's been very secretive, what we call the dirty, dark secrets in the wine business. So you couple up. These people don't care. As you know, I can appreciate as a business person, these people don't care about making wine better or healthier. They care about making it cheaper and faster. They use chemicals to do that. These chemicals, in fairness to the wine industry, and I'll tell you what their response is to all this, you know, their response is these chemicals are not harmful. They're not used in harmful enough uh, amounts. They're, you know, this toxicity, these herbicides, these pesticides are not, they're, you know, they're not in high enough concentrations to uh, and negatively impact your health. You know, we don't know if that's true or not. Here's what we do know about toxic farming is that grapes on the dirty dozen list of fruits and vegetables that hold the highest residual value of herbicides and pesticides from toxic farming are number eight on the dirty dozen for the highest residual. Now, Here's our response to it is we don't have any scientific studies in fairness to Mr. and Mrs. Wine industry. We don't have any scientific studies that say drinking these toxins and farming and additives are unhealthy for you. But our position is quite simple. If I don't have to drink these toxins, I don't want to drink these toxins, right? In any amount. And so the wine industry's other response is that 
you know, we're in compliance with all federal regulations on disclosure of these top toxins. And that's true because there aren't any federal regulations on it. Right. And so so this this is this is kind of the standard response from the industry. So money and what's what's in Wall Street and on the private equity world is called a roll up. So you had a whole bunch of corporate money, cheap public money that went out and acquired all these wineries and rolled them up into a consolidated industry of people who do not give a damn about your health or about making better wine. They care about making it cheaper and faster. So money's the first problem. The second problem is toxicity in farming, which we just talked about. 95% of vineyards worldwide, 4% in California are organic. So let's call it 95% of vineyards in the world are farmed with chemicals. And if you want to drink those chemicals, fine by me. I just choose not to drink them. I'm My goal is to extend my health span and my longevity, but primarily my health span. I don't believe drinking these toxic chemicals is helpful to my health span. So I choose not to drink them, and I choose to create a business that allows other people who care about that also not to drink them. If you don't care, you know, knock yourself out. Number three are the what the additives, the 76 additives. And again, what I'm going to tell you here is all documented. You can go to our website and get it, or you can do your own research. Um, but of the 76 additives and this kind of, and then we'll talk about natural wine and then we can go on to some other topics like how destructive and harmful alcohol is. Uh, because I think that's important to talk about and tell you about my journey with alcohol and why I think it's important to think about alcohol. But before we get there, let's talk about the additives and also uh, what is a natural wine. Because a natural wine is a confusing term to consumers because they're like, aren't all wines natural? And for the reasons I've already described to you and what I'm going to tell you about the additives, no, they are not natural. They're what we call conventional wines. That's everything that's not natural. So the additives are 76 of them. A few of them are natural in in fairness. And then quite a few of them are pretty nasty. Two are classified by the World Health Organization and the National Institutes of Health, with this, which is a U.S. health agency that publishes a database called PubChem. And so you can go to the internet and go to PubChem, and then you can research each of these additives. We've already done that for you, but of these, of these 76 additives, two of them are considered acute toxins. Now, acute toxin has a very specific clinical definition, and acute toxin, for those who don't know, which would have been me before, acute toxin means that one dose or multiple doses over a 24-hour period may be fatal. That's an acute toxin. 12 of the 76 are classified by the National Institutes of Health as health hazards. Four of them, four of these additives are derivatives from six different animal organs, including pig pancreas and cow stomach. If you care about animal rights or the use of animal products, that's important to you. Uh, we're not convinced that the derivatives from these animal organs are harmful to you, but they're kind of nasty. Uh, and then eight of these additives are derivatives of some black mold, including okra toxin A, which is a known carcinogenic. Wow. So, Again, the wine industry spot is quite simple. They, they've been sued a few times and they've been successful in navigating lawsuits because their response is these uh, toxins are not known to be harmful to humans in these amounts. Well, again, our, our position is the same. We don't know whether they're harmful or not because there's no scientific study to validate whether they are or are not harmful. It's just no, there's just, there's no evidence to support it. But what we do know is that they're toxic 
and their health and they are unhealthy and they're sketchy. And given the option of drinking them or not drinking them, I choose not to drink them. Right. So yeah, that's kind of our position. I'm sure you feel the same way. Oh, totally. I mean, that that's like I, everybody that listens and including myself, like we, we, Ed try to educate ourselves so that we can avoid these things because we're trying to avoid disease down the road and prevention is a big part of that. And you're pretty much making decisions daily that are either influencing you towards per- the progression of disease, or it's helping your body. Um, it's helping its defense mechanisms to support healing. And, you know, if you are unknowingly choosing things that are minimizing the ability of your immune system and your detoxification organs to do their job, like you are running a really high risk of allowing disease to really start to take root in different areas of your body and then begin to proliferate. So I'm just curious, these additives, the animal byproducts really that just blew my mind because I had no idea, but what is the point? You know, what, what's the intention and purpose? Is it because it's 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 quite simple. It's quite simple. It's they're they're used to um, one of the acute toxins. Uh, well, the most poisonous of them all is called dimethyl dicarbonate. It's the number one toxin used in wine. <laughs> its purpose is to um, to cure a bacterial fault in wines known as Brettomyces. Brettomyces is a bacteria that uh, finds its way into cellars and eventually into wine. And this bacteria creates an off-putting aromatic and taste to the wine. It's a bit barnyardy, a bit poopy. Okay, so this chemical dimethyl dicarbonate is used to correct this bacterial fault. It's used to treat tens of millions of gallons of wine in California worldwide every year. Problem is, because there's no transparent labeling, we forgot about that. Why don't I know about these additives? Well, I'll tell you why you don't know about the additives. Because by law, the wine industry is not required to disclose what's in the bottle, not ingredients or any nutritional information. Now, this is not an accident. The wine industry and their lobbyists publicly oppose such labeling. If you go to their primary lobbyist website that's in Washington, D.C., they publicly post on their website that they are opposed to transparent labeling. We think that every wine bottle should have ingredients label on it, anything that's put in it, as well as nutritional information. So you should know if you're drinking dimethyl dicarbonate and the government allows for residual parts of 200 parts per million of this very toxic chemical. Uh, It is one of the acute toxins. If you were to drink or be exposed to wine treated with this chemical within 24 hours of treatment, you could die. And so this, this is, and all of that, and the precautions for handling this highly, highly toxic chemical are all on the manufacturer's website, right? So, but, you know, 19 years ago, uh, a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. called the Center for Science and Public Interest filed a petition with the Treasury Department. This is another interesting thing about, uh, about wine oversight. See, the oversight of wine and its ingredients and its labeling, that oversight is by a government entity called the TTB, which is a part of the Treasury Department. It's not the FDA. Uh, This is interesting. Wine gets a carve out. See, for all other like hard kombuchas, uh, lots of other alcohol products come under the purview of the FDA. Wine is administered as our spirits by the TTB, which is a division of the Treasury Department. TTB stands for Trade and Tax Bureau. Now, their job has nothing to do with protecting your health. Their job 
and mission, given their name, the Trade and Tax Bureau, they work for the Treasury Department. Their job is to generate tax dollars, not protect your health. And so there's a number of misalignments in Washington about drinking and your health. So now in fairness, some other, as I mentioned, hard kombuchas is one concept. They come under the purview as do hard ciders or white claw or any of these kind of products come under the purview. Now, those are all factory products, mind you, but they come under the purview of, of the FDA because they're alcohol content. Once the alcohol content falls below 7%, it now becomes the purview of the FDA. That purview includes nutritional labeling and contents requirements and so on and so forth. But the wine and spirits industry, through their political power, has been carved out from this sort of disclosure and purview. I know this all sounds like a super dark, nasty story because it just is. So yeah. if you care about what you put in your body and you care about the implications of that, then you'll care about drinking natural wine if you drink wine. So what is a natural wine? Then we can move on to some more controversial topics like alcohol in general. Yeah, this is, it's truly fascinating to think about it this way. And I'm glad you explained that because it is very complicated and there are tons of conflicts of interest all across the board. And we can talk, we can really apply this to so many different industries, including, you know, the farming industry and just food in general. But to think that the products that have that, like you said, are considered the wine, the spirits, I mean, they have big implications for your health. And yet there's really, they don't have to disclose anything. I mean, if you pick up a bottle of wine on the shelf, I've noticed this, the only information that you're getting is really the name of the brand, maybe where it was harvested and the year. And that's it's it. marketing. And it's called marketing, right? right? It's not, it's storytelling and marketing. It's not, it's not educational or informative. On the other hand, if I pick up a bottle or box or package of anything I consume, the first thing I do is look to see what's in it. Yeah. And most particularly, what the carb count and the sugar content is, because these are things I care about. I'm not, from my school of thought, I'm not as concerned about caloric intake, but I am concerned about carbohydrate and particularly concerned with, with sugar content. Yeah. And so, which is why I don't drink most things that come from a bottle or can, because most everything contains more sugar than. I, I don't want to consume any sugar personally, but, but so, but let me d just define before we move on to the, some of the more interesting things like sugar and, yeah. and alcohol and um, just some general guidelines for thinking about drinking. Let's just define what a natural wine is because it's confusing to people. I say, I only drink natural wine. They're like, aren't all the wines natural? My answer is no, for the reasons I've already described here for you. They're not, they're very unnatural. They're factory mm -hmm. products in most cases. <clears throat> so a natural wine has three components. One, it's always fermented from organic or biodynamic grapes. Biodynamic farming is an, is an advanced prescriptive form of organic farming. Number two, this is sort of the most confusing. They are always fermented natural wines, which is a very specific category within wine. It represents less than 1%, one percent, one tenth of 1% of all the wines in the world. It's a very, very small category. Now we're the largest importer and reseller of natural wines in the world, but it's a very, very small category within the wine. It's a subset within the wine industry. Most wines are conventionally made. So a natural wine is always fermented with wild indigenous native yeast. I'll tell you what that means in a moment. Commercial wines are fermented with GMO lab cultured yeast. What does that mean for our health? We don't really know. Here's what we do know. When you drink natural wine, you feel a lot better. Yeah. Uh, so a natural indigenous native yeast is found present in the wild in every vineyard. So when you harvest wine grapes, all wine grapes worldwide, no matter where they're grown or how they're farmed, 
contain yeast on the skin. It's collected naturally in the air. It's a white waxy film. You can scratch it off with your fingernail. That's actually yeast. That wild native yeast, which is indigenous to the flora and biology of that vineyard, is the yeast that natural winemakers use for fermentation. It is not the yeast that conventional commercial winemakers use. And the reason they don't use it is because you can't make wine in very large volumes with this native wild yeast. It's too fragile, too temperamental. Uh, The risk of a broken fermentation is too high and all kinds of issues associated with it. Alcohol levels get too high. It will kill native yeast. So the solution to that is that is that you that the conventional winemaker uses a GMO lab cultured yeast. It's been modified to withstand higher alcohol environments. It's been modified to be sturdy and very strong. And so you can make wine in large volumes and you don't have to coddle it or pay much attention to it. It just does its thing. And number three cornerstone of a natural wine is that they're additive free. So they're organically or biodynamically farmed. They're fermented with wild indigenous native yeast, and they're added to free. In Dry Farm Wines case, we have a few other criteria that are important to us that go into the Dry Farm Wines certification. So at Dry Farm Wines, we created the highest standard of purity for wines in the world. So in addition to the three I just mentioned, which are the baseline. In addition to that, a dry farm wines, they must also be grown without irrigation, which is known as dry farming. On the vineyards that we farm worldwide, it saves over a billion gallons of water a year in the fact that we don't allow irrigation or that we don't irrigate. Number two, and to comment on irrigation, irrigation is not necessary for grape farming. Irrigation has only been used in grape farming since the 1970s. Prior to that, everything was dry farmed. Um, Grapes have been growing all over the planet in very harsh conditions for about 9,000 years. Irrigation is used to make farming easier, cheaper, and more profitable. So we don't allow use of irrigation. On top of that, we require that all of our wines be sugar-free. The only way to know if a wine is sugar-free is to lab test it. We also require that they be very low in naturally occurring sulfites. So if you know in every wine bottle it says this product contains sulfites. Well, anything that's fermented, um, <clears throat> including kombucha as an example, anything that's fermented, has naturally occurring sulfites. The question is, did the producer, for various reasons, including using it as a preservative, add sulfur dioxide to increase the overall sulfite count? So we do lab testing for sulfites to make sure that this extra acute toxin has not been added to the wine. So dry farm wines, and then finally, we only sell and drink lower alcohol wine. So anything below 12 and a half. So we sell wines between 7% and 12 and a half percent. Commercial wines today on average are teetering just right at 15% alcohol. We believe that alcohol is unhealthy. So we can move to that for a moment, unless you had any questions about the aforementioned. No, this is great. I love, I love all of the ground that we're covering because it really is illuminating things that maybe we wouldn't be so keen to ask just because we don't know as a consumer that a lot of these things exist um, in the wine space and really just in the space of the the alcohol industry. And I think what where we're going is kind of this push, and you alluded to this earlier, really in the natural health space, we've seen this vocalization of, you know, alcohol is a neurotoxin. A lot of people speaking out about the detrimental effects of alcohol. It's true. I'm going to speak out against it too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I love that you're, you're even willing to address this too, because, you know, I think some people just, we live in absolutes and it's like, oh my gosh, I'll never touch alcohol again. It's going to ruin me. And I'm like, I think that there, there is a little nuance though, because 
let's be honest. I mean, there are celebrations, there are birthday parties, there are, you know, times in life. And it's like, then being informed that to me is helpful because every now and then I do like to have a glass of wine. I just want to know what I'm consuming. So I would love for you because of your expertise in this space, like what is your take on all of the noise and conversation about alcohol and, you know, it being a neurotoxin and the influence of toxicity on the body? Um, because I'm sure you've got a lot of, uh, you know, some things to add in there to layer in there that would make a difference for us understanding. Well, I mean, I, I completely agree with all of it. And I have been on record for years of saying that much to the surprise of the audience, you know, like I thought this is the wine guys here to sell wine. It's like, well, not really. The wine will sell itself because it's a superior product that's better for you and you feel better and you can celebrate your evenings and protect your morning. And so this, this is, you know, the wine takes care of itself. My goal is to educate people about how to think about it. And then if they choose to drink wine, they should think about, whether or not they want to drink low alcohol, sugar-free natural wines. And if they do, then they should buy that from us. And if they don't, well, you know, they should drink whatever they want. But yes, I believe that alcohol is a dangerous neurotoxin. I believe that alcohol in any amount is unhealthy for the human beast. We'll get into that in a moment about how unhealthy and how it might be healthy. But generally speaking, ethyl alcohol, in my view, is not, I think most anybody would be better served long-term from a physiological health point of view, biological health, and potentially neurological health in certain areas to not drink at all. That being said, that program doesn't really work for me because I love wine and I'm on this journey of joy and happiness and wine's a part of that. And so um, I want to get back to that in a moment. But as for the toxicity of alcohol and the promotion of drinking, I'm not here to promote drinking. If, if you don't drink today, I certainly am not recommending that you begin drinking. And furthermore, some people just shouldn't drink at all. Yeah, They have addiction issues or it's unhealthy or they don't process alcohol well genetically. They're just some people who shouldn't drink at all. And I'm not suggesting that those people drink either. Now that leaves the rest of us. And here's how I do think about drinking. Mark Andreessen, famous venture capitalist in Silicon Valley recently did a blog post. <clears throat> and he said, you know, I experimented with stopping drinking about six months ago. And you know what? I felt better. And I'm mad as hell about it. And he went on to say, yes, while I do feel better, I end up working all night and the color from my evenings has been diminished and removed. Mm. But yes, I do feel better, but the color of my evenings is gone. And I find myself just working more, although I feel a little bit better. Now, he's a whiskey drinker, which is a whole different level of drinking than wine. But so, you know, how I think about wine is that I don't drink every day anymore. I used to. Um, I Until just recently, I drank every day. Uh, not, well, let me say every night. I have a number of drinking rules. I don't drink during the daytime ever. Um, I don't eat during the daytime either. I eat one meal and one meal a day at night and that's when I drink, but now I don't drink every day, but I used to, because you know what I felt, I found that I just feel better if I drink a little less. Now people in the wine industry are staggered to hear some guy who's in the wine business telling people, you know, maybe you shouldn't drink as much because they're like, I mean, is this guy lost his mind? He's trying to sell wine. It's like, no. Not really. The wine will sell itself because, see, I do drink wine and frequently and sometimes more than I should. Well, oftentimes more than I should, but I like it and I have fun and it opens my heart and it opens the heart of other people and it rolls down that window of vulnerability and people bond and it's just fun. Right. And I just love the taste of fine wine. 
I love the taste of natural wine. I love food and wine together. I love the celebration of a dinner table. I love the banter. I love the jokes. I'm quite funny. The more I drink, the cuter I get, right? <laughs> like, I just love this. Yeah. This is so much fun. I love being around a dinner table of eight or 10 people drinking a copious amount of wine. This adds a lot of joy to my life. And so for me, I'm willing to trade off this temporary toxicity yeah. uh, in exchange for uh, in exchange for a whole lot of fun. And that's just a trade-off that I'm going to make. And I do that, you know, several times a week. I used to do it every night, but I found that if I take a few nights off, I just feel a little bit better and I'm more productive in my cognitive responsibilities in my enterprise and professional life. I just find that it's better for me if I take a few nights off. But as for the rest of the time, I can hit it pretty hard and have a lot of fun, right? And so that's, you know, you have to balance yeah. this joy and pleasure and the, 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 the openness and the love that something like natural wine can bring into your life against these momentary exposures to this toxin. So I don't know, it's as straightforward as I can think about it. I yeah. hope it makes sense. Oh, totally. I think it gives... Uh, one, just a lot of credibility, because like you said, somebody that does this for a living sells wine for a living that's saying, Hey, it's not for everyone. And you know, in, in the game of longevity, like it is in your best interest to not be consuming this all of the time. However, there is real significance in valuing the emotional health of your body by being able to say, yeah, I can participate in something that's going to bring laughter and joy and community together. I mean, wine is biblical. Like that was Jesus's first miracle is turning, you know, water into wine over a celebration. Like wine has been consumed culturally in the arts, religion for 9,000 years. Yeah. Has it killed a lot of people? Sure. Not, not specifically wine, but really alcohol yeah. toxicity and abuse yeah. and addictive behavior has ruined millions and millions and millions of lives over history. Yeah. Those people shouldn't drink, and right. I, I I hope they don't. It 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 does not make it doesn't impact me that way. I don't. I find that I can put a governor on it. I don't like. I'm not. But again, I have some guardrails. I don't drink during the daytime. I do not drink spirits. I don't drink anything but low alcohol natural wine. Those are my guardrails. I don't drink every day. Those are my guard. I did. It's worth mentioning because I've been on. A hundred podcasts. I've been a couple hundred podcasts, and this not drinking every day is a fairly recent thing. I'm, you know, I've, I've been recorded uh, a lot is drinking every day because it's true. But I found that if I drank, it's an aging thing too because I'm 62, and so it's, you know, it's a, um, it, it's really, you know, as you age, you have to start making different decisions if you intend, like eating once per day. It's not possible for me to maintain the lean body mass that I want, both primarily from a vanity point of view, but also for longevity and wellness. I can't, while there's some science to suggest that there's not necessarily a relationship between lean body mass and longevity, for me, I feel better being lean. I can't stay as lean as I want eating more than one meal per day. And I, even then I have to do regular extended water fasting in order for me to maintain the lean body mass I want at my age and to slow down my aging process. And since I've been fasting and practicing other uh, modalities and rituals, my aging is actually reversed, right? So particularly my appearance, I look much younger than I did 10 or 20 years ago. Wow. And so, you know, that, but, but you have to, grapple with the reality of aging anytime much after you're 40. They're going to be like, and every decade, it becomes more intentional uh, and the decisions and discipline become more rigid. If you, like now I'm training for 70 and 80, right? And so it's like pretty shocking to me that in seven years and some change, I'll be 70 years old. That's just sort of shocking. It's hard to believe. 
but and I'm certainly in much more vibrant than most people my age. I look younger than most people my age. So, but 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 the because of these modalities. But one of the things you have to do is you have to start reacting to the reality of those decades and making decisions that are going to require you to execute your life in a different way if you want to achieve the same goals. Yep. Yeah. It's that bio-individuality. And I think you made a really important point there in saying that you're changing the formula as your body changes, because there's going to be different needs in different seasons. And we talk about this a lot. It's not just a, Hey, this is your blueprint for your body. And this is the, you know, where you stay, uh, consistent and you'll always have the same byproduct or output. Like you've got to be willing to change because your body is always evolving and changing. And you've just, you know, I mean, we're, we're born with one set of equipment. So that equipment looks different in your forties than it does in your twenties. So you've got to be able to adjust and, and kind of play with those toggles in your life. What would you say, you know, outside of some of these practices, like your OMOD one meal a day, which is really cool. Like that fasting practice and everything, um, you know, especially when it comes to wine, like you, we've heard in the past, like, you know, oh, there's antioxidants. It's good for heart health. Like, what would you say about that? Because there, there was like a huge thing where it was like, oh, that's like, it's, you know, that should be a, a good practice. They, it was almost like this marketing campaign for wine um, for a lot of people as a proponent for, you know, improving cardiovascular health or something like that. Yeah. So we really come down to a, a couple of things where that's concerned. So 60 minutes, 20 years ago, did a, did a piece on the French paradox. You know, why do the French, yeah. you know, they eat bread and cheese and smoke and, you know, and, but they drink a lot of red wine. And so it's like, could it be the red wine that's causing them to have this not be gain weight the way that Westerners gain weight typically in the U S is it, you know, is it, you know, is this some kind of paradox to do with red wine? And then that started off, a whole discussion about polyphenols, flavonoids, and mm -hmm. antiflavonoids that are found primarily in red wines. So there are about 200 polyphenols found in white wine and over 800 found in red wine. The most famous one, and the wine industry loved to latch on to this, the most famous of these polyphenols is known as resveratrol. And Dr. David Sinclair, who's recognized as a leading expert today, in the field of the biology, in the field of the biology of aging, as lab at Harvard, has published widely on the benefits of resveratrol, and he consumes resveratrol on a daily basis. And I know him, and we drank wine, and you know we talk a lot about this. And he's a huge proponent of resveratrol. But here's the thing, and he would tell you this too. Just drinking red wine alone, is it going to give you a dose of resveratrol that's high enough to potentially replicate the life extension found in organisms? So there's resveratrol has never been clinically proved to extend the lifespan of humans, but there is evidence to suggest that it extends the lifespan of other organisms, including mice, but the, and most of the work's been done in yeast and worms and organisms that have much shorter lifespans. You can work more closely with studies, but, but it has been shown to extend the lifespan in mice. <clears throat> that being said, the dose required for life extension in mice is far greater than anything you could get from drinking red wine every day. And so you'd have to supplement with it if, in fact, you buy into this theory that uh, that resveratrol extends human life, which at the moment, there's no real clinical proof for that. So, I, you know, I don't hang too much on that. I, again, I, I think about I think about life in terms of joy and peace, you know, having a peaceful life is the most important aspect of having a joyful and happy and settled life. And so, and then, and then laughter, I think is, you know, one of the greatest medicines of all time for a joyful and happy and healthy life and, and community. And one of the things that, 
you know, there's been widespread debate about the blue zones as an example, the five zones throughout the world that Dan Buettner, who is uh, the author of the study on the blue zones by National Geographic. Dan is a friend of mine. He lives here in Miami Beach where I live. And you know what Dan would tell you, who's a regular wine drinker, uh, red wine, what he would tell you is that, you know, this, the two most important things that happen in the blue zones, in his view, are the consumption of beans and uh, and the, uh, the, ex- the daily exercise that these people get. And perhaps most importantly, the sense of community in these small communities where people know and socialize a lot together. And they oftentimes do that over wine. And this is where wine gets back to this sense of joy and banter and love and this opening the window to our soul of vulnerability and sharing things and, uh, you know, even furthering gossip in some cases. It's just, you know, it's just it opens everything up. It just opens up this whole world of connection between people. And so do, is it the wine that causes that or is it the sense of community that causes that? It's probably all combined. But yeah. I know in my particular case that wine is a, is a significant lubricant to um, to expanding uh, the closeness and the fun and the laughter and the intellectual discovery and the vulnerability between humans. And so is it toxic? Yes. Does it have an upside? Probably. You know, it's all in the dose and the frequency. Yeah. And whatever else is in it that you're drinking. So that's why it's really important that I do what I do. In addition to making a decent living selling wine, my real job is to help people discover what I discovered, which made my wine drinking life and health far, far exceed what it was drinking conventional wines. And so is there a whole lot of science around that? No. But... I can tell you, and you've experienced, if you drink these low alcohol, sugar-free natural wines, you feel much, much better. Yep. hundred percent. I can speak to that on a personal level because I love to track uh, any type of data that I can get. So with my aura ring or with a CGM, and I actually have done a little bit of an, a human experiment uh, in using dry farms wine and tracking blood sugar and sleep, particularly HRV, because that's one you'll see totally tank. Um, if you have alcohol, really most alcohol in general, but what I noticed is that not only did I just sense a better you know, just overall recovery and well being the following day, meaning no headaches, no brain fog, feeling like, you know, you had taken maybe a whole Benadryl or something like that before, like, you know, that kind of that fog you can be in. But I actually saw the data support that I had much better recovery. And that was without doing, you know, a lot of liver supportive herbs and all of these extras too, because I really wanted to see like, how does my body tolerate this? Um, and so, and I did see, you know, especially with blood sugar, like you said, um, that there was not really any movement on my blood sugar. And then on top of that, the HRV and the recovery at night, my sleep was not impaired and impacted the way it was when I tried just like the stuff off the shelf. Um, there was a noticeable difference. Um, so that's just like a little, just personal side of comparing the two, because what you may not be able to see on the surface level, or maybe even taste, if you're not like a wine connoisseur and like, you can definitely taste it. If you, if you (laughs) drink wine frequently, uh, or, or just really, you know, have any frame of reference. Um, but those are just things that I noticed. And I think is really important to point out when you're talking about, you know, consuming different things, um, in the wine space. Yeah, you can. I mean, look, if you've been drinking natural wine for a while and you go back to drinking a conventional wine, first of all, you can't do it. Yeah. It tastes terrible. And um, and the higher alcohol is terrible. It makes the wine hot. Um, and it's not food friendly. And you can smell and taste chemicals in it. Absolutely. Even, even the most elementary person who has sensory awareness yeah. Uh, once you stop drinking that wine and you drink natural wine for a couple of weeks and you go back and you drink a conventional wine, you can taste and you can smell these chemicals. That's the it's, thing. It's a very lot of time, unnatural. You can right, smell a it. Lo- 
a lot of people are just used to drinking the mainstream stuff. So you really don't, you're, you're not, your senses. No, are you're bad. acclimated. You think that's what yeah. wine tastes like, but it's exactly. not. Exactly. Yeah. You're just acclimated to drinking these chemicals and you think that's what wine tastes like. But once you stop drinking it for a week yeah. or two, you realize this isn't right. Yeah. And I feel terrible when I, it tastes terrible and I feel yep. terrible. And it doesn't, it just takes a week or two to realize that because we're all creatures of habit and taste. We like to think that, you know, we like to think, oh, we're adventurous eaters. That's not normally true. Well, we might try something new here and there, but usually we fall into similar eating, eating patterns. Yeah. Right. And so, because we get acclimated, we're ha- we're creatures of habit and we get acclimated to uh, our palate being adjusted to things that we know and like. And so we're not nearly as adventurous as we think, but it doesn't take long. Um, sugar is another great example. Once you stop eating sugar and get past the withdrawals of stopping it for a period of two to four weeks, you'll notice a substantial difference in which you to eat it again. It would taste super sweet, right? It would yep. be, you would acclimate away from it and taste more your native tongue. Um, you know, which is more sensitive. Once you stop eating processed foods and particularly refined sugars, you'll find that your palate in time returns back to its natural state. Yeah. And your microbiome is incredibly affected as well, because just like, you know, these chemicals and, uh, and the alcohol and the sugars, I mean, they're feeding all of your gut microbes and it, coming off of that and then making the shift to something I'm telling you, it will completely alter your microbiome. So if you've got yeast overgrowths, or if you have tendencies for these types of overgrowths and infections, you're just feeding it right with all of these different, um, compounds that ultimately modulate different components of your microbiome. And that, that can create a whole host of symptoms for a lot of people. And you just may be putting gasoline on the fire every single time and you're not realizing it. And then you're having to go and deal with all of these symptoms and diagnosis that are related to these gut imbalances that, you know, it's just kind of a repetitive cycle. So I would love to know from you because you are so ingrained in this space, what is something that is either you know, alarming to you about where the space is in, in terms of wine, um, wine farms. And we see this a lot, you know, just in agriculture in general, but since you've got a real finger on the pulse or, or maybe something that, um, excites you, like, is there, is there any positive movement? I mean, now we're, we're seeing more people like yourself, your voice that comes out and educating people, but what is it that you've got your eye on right now that you feel like is really important for people to understand about, uh, kind of this arena? I don't know that there's anything has really changed there. You know, there's a higher since I've told a few million people about there is a higher sense of awareness and a little bit better education. But, you know, I think um, I I don't know that anything has really changed Uh, among the educated, among the people who seek information from podcasts like yours. Yes, you see that those people are evolving in general, around wine and farming, you see, a, you know, there's a movement towards more organic farming, but it's such a small movement yeah. that it doesn't really have, you know, much gravity in the, in the overall world of farming. You know, we're killing the planet um, in a number of different ways, um, but farming is not a small part of that uh, yeah. in terms of, in terms of killing the, uh, the, the, micro organisms that live below the surface of the earth, billions of them uh, that we expose to these chemical farming and to plowing and the over farming of land and the killing of living soils. And so, I mean, it's, I, there's, I don't see any immediate kind of solve as a cure for that. I mean, it's just too profitable. What you have to, when you look at across any of the, systems that need to be changed in our country, whether that's taxation or tort reform or education or campaign finance reform, you look at all of these things that we could make pretty small but significant changes to and have significant societal benefit. You look at any of them and you just don't see hope for change because the legacy interest of money the legacy cash flow that is coming from these toxic methods of farming that are not 
going to be seen for maybe another generation or two. Meanwhile, the people who are doing it now are getting rich, and that's their goal is to enjoy their now now, right? So the legacy financial interests that are in all of these uh, channels, uh, whether it be farming or manufacturing or you know, societal, political, or policy changes that need to take place. It would make a huge difference to do a few things. You just don't see much hope for those things changing because the legacy financial cash flow that exists within the wrong part of it, yeah, you know, is just hard to disrupt because there's no short-term fix for replacing that legacy um, cash flow. Credit cards are a great example. I mean, you know, it, could you make a case for, a universal, even worldwide digital currency? Sure. Is it crypto? Who knows? But could you make an intellectual case for uh, a, a global digital currency that make things a lot easier and more efficient? No matter what you call it or where it comes from, sure, you can make a huge intellectual case for that. Is it going to happen? Probably not in our lifetime because the legacy interests of people like banks and credit cards, they control the strings. They're the power players, right? And so dis disintermediating that power is very difficult. And so you see that in farming as well. It's everywhere. You know, we know better doesn't mean we're going to do better, right? Yeah. Because we'd have to disintermediate and dislodge these legacy financial players in order to get real change to occur. That's just not likely to happen. So I don't see anything terribly exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there's some exciting things happening in the world, but I'm not sure that they're around wine or farming there. You know, there is yeah. an emerging, <clears throat> there is an emerging collective consciousness. It's not large, but you know, it's larger than it's ever been in terms of self-awareness, consciousness, meditation, things that are people are becoming more aware of how to advance their mental health and their peace. I think there's some real, I think there's some real highlights there in farming and wine, probably not. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, what's, that's what I think that we're seeing a lot of is the power of people in unity. There is a lot of strength in, you know, a collective amount of people that say absolutely not. And so I think, you know, in really, when we take that application to consumer goods, if we really see the the this decline in the management of the environment, like the best way is for people to stop participating in the activity that is, you know, the the, re, the root cause of that decline. So if it means like not buying certain products, then don't buy those products because they're cutting corners and adding chemicals or doing things that are not good for your body. And they're not good for the earth either. They're not, we're not managing our resources well. So I love that you have such a, an incredible voice and you speak to this so eloquently um, and you really make things kind of practical and, and accessible for a lot of us in understanding. But I think that that does hold power. So know that you as a consumer, you know, you get to vote every time you buy something. So if it's something that is, has value to you, like don't diminish that, like it is important and it does count. And like you said, that, that generational legacy, like, you know, we, what we're doing now is not for the here and now. Um, and I think that, you know, we for sure connect on that. It's, it's looking downstream, it's looking 10 years, 20 years and further generations down the road. And it's like, how are we becoming better stewards of what we have? So I love that we kind of landed here because I feel like it really brought everything full circle, but I've learned so much and I already am I have, I loved your brand. I lo I've loved your wines for several years and, uh, I don't drink all of the time, but you know, I can definitely vouch. I keep, I will order my box and I savor them and I enjoy them. And then when I break them open for friends and family, I tell them all about it. I'm like, this is the good stuff guys. Like we're not, <laughs> we're not just, you know, having the store bought. Um, so it gives me an opportunity. And I will say, if you order any of their wines, they do such an incredible job packaging everything with the, all of the different resources. Like there's so much information that comes with the box that will tell you about the farms that these wines come from. So you get to learn a little bit more. Um, it's just, 
all the way around, like an incredible experience. And I think that that that's really a, what is so unique about this is that it's not just, you know, a quick fix or we're just buying something like we're, we're learning, we're enjoying, we're creating community. Um, so Todd, you're, you're a smart cookie, but I love that we got to have this conversation and that you came on to do kind of a second part, uh, to this, to this whole topic. Nice. Thanks for having me today. I wish everybody well and uh, happy journeys on the wine road. But yes. uh, thank you again. It was a great time. Well, can you give everybody, I know that we've talked about Dry Farm, but just give us one last, you know, little where where all the places are that we can find and access um, the website, anything like that. I will make sure I drop it in the show notes for you guys so that, you know, you can come back to this later and reference it. But if you're looking for more information about Dry Farms, Todd, where can everybody access some of these amazing products? It's super simple. So we are Dry Farm Wines on all social media. I'm Dry Farm Todd on uh on the ig but we're dryfarmwines.com dry farm wines on all social media it's super easy to find we're kind of omnipresent in that world we're everywhere uh publishing all kinds of great information educationally lifestyle food wine travel uh architectural design we publish on a lot of things that we define as a life lived well mm. um and so <clears throat> Yeah, so that we're we're super super easy to find, and we have a lot of followers, and we're kind of all over social. But yeah, so super easy to find, and and uh, happy to be of service in any way can on a healthier road forward for everyone. Sounds great. Well, guys, thank you so much for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Like, share, subscribe if you're li listening or watching on YouTube, and we will see you on the next episode. Uh -huh.